the beginning and it actually doesn't ask you for a signature anymore. Okay, good. It just so, asks you for the photo, so no problems with that. I took that off there. Wonderful. So I'm on. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Um, All right. Just, Thank what, you, what, everyone. We're about to trans... We are on Facebook Live, so... Um, oh, sorry, Maureen, go ahead. I just wanted to quickly remind people that tomorrow is a Healthy California Commission, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m., Wednesday um, is Medicare for All Resolutions webinar at which Cheng Sim, Lim, and Sean Broadbent have been invited to speak with the Jayapal team with Jayapal and talk about their work that they did getting LA City to pass a resolution. And um, other than that, we have our text banking and our office hours, which are at their usual time. So thank you. Beautiful way to um, close the meeting. Thank you so much, Maureen. Um, thank you, everybody. And um, you can also go to our website, hcala.org, into the calendar section, and you'll see um, the events that uh, Maureen just talked about. Um, we do have, looks like one minute till we go ahead and start. And it looks like we have both of our speakers here. I'd like to say welcome, Dr. Jim Kahn, and welcome, Nurse Barbara Cummins. Uh, welcome. <laughs> Good evening. Welcome, welcome. We're so happy that you're here with us. I am too. And with that, um, we'll go ahead and welcome everybody um, who's joining us on Facebook. My name is Erica Ferriston, and I am Director of Healthcare for All Los Angeles uh, with Maureen Cruz and co-chairs Chung Sim Lim, Bronwyn Major, and Gina Harris. Healthcare for All Los Angeles is a local chapter of Healthcare for All California, which is a statewide, uh, all-volunteer, nonprofit, nonpartisan organization. Our mission is to achieve a universal healthcare system through single payer public financing with the goal that all California residents have comprehensive, high quality health care. Um, and thanks to the California Nurses Association, we have a single payer bill. Um, we have a California Medicare for All bill. It's called Assembly Bill 1400, the Guaranteed Health Care for All Act. Its nickname is CalCare, get it, California Care. I think that's really cute. Um, and so um, we're very excited and that is what uh, we are focused on at this time. Um, we are going to start tonight off with a land acknowledgement. Um, we've borrowed this with permission from White People for Black Lives. Um, Healthcare for All Los Angeles acknowledges the Tongva peoples as the traditional caretakers of the land we currently reside on. That is the Los Angeles Basin and Southern Channel Islands. We seek to honor the land and the courageous people who have been its stewards, modeling a tradition of resistance seeking liberation. We pay our respects to ancestors, elders, and relations past present and emerging. If you are outside the greater Los Angeles area, you can find out whose land you are on by going to native-land.ca. Um, the format for tonight is we are, we're gonna watch a brief uh, clip. We are going to listen to speakers and then we'll have question and answer at the end. For those of you on Facebook, um, go ahead and just drop your questions into the Facebook chat and Paul Newman, if you want to give a little hand raise, Paul, so they know who you are. Um, he will ask your questions to our speakers. For those of you on Zoom, please drop your questions um, in the chat and I will ask your questions. Um, Paul and I will alternate between Facebook and Zoom. Um, we're going to ask that when um, our speakers begin, for those of you on Zoom, to please um, mute yourselves. And also, when we play the video, we need you to turn your videos off because it will interfere um, with the video on the screen. So 
you'll mute yourselves, you'll turn your videos off. And then if you'd like to turn your videos back on when our speakers come on, um, please do. And with that, I am now going to turn it over to Maureen Cruz. Thank you. Thank you for being here, everybody. Um, as Erica said, first, we're going to view a 30 minute webinar by Dr. Ed Weisbart, who's a retired family physician uh, in Missouri and chair of the Missouri chapter of Physicians for National Health Program. Um, Dr. Weisbart is a nationally known speaker oh. on single, pardon? Someone speaking, okay. A nationally known speaker on single payer whose video presentations, articles, podcasts, research, and PowerPoints are all available online on Facebook, YouTube, and at pnhp.org. And he posts on Twitter. Uh, Dr. Weisbart practiced family medicine for 20 years at Rush Medical Center in Chicago, then in St. Louis until retiring in 2010. Um, Dr. Weisbart says that Medicare is a genuine American success story and a lifeline for millions of seniors. Dr. Weisbart in his um, work details the waste, inefficiency, inappropriate, unethical, and even illegal schemes associated with commercial health insurance, including the overpriced and restrictive Medicare Advantage program. He explains how an improved version of traditional Medicare would provide better coverage for all at no additional cost. So in this webinar, Dr. Weisbart also describes the latest um, Center for uh, Medicare and Medicaid innovation experiment known as direct contracting entities as a dangerous path to full privatization of all Medicare, which will retain the profit motive, add intermediaries, restrict choice, install networks, and maintain the dangerous delays and denials of care. The DCEs, as these are called, will maintain and extend the current strategies of Medicare Advantage to traditional Medicare. So we will watch the, the um, it's a 30 minute presentation that will kind of give us an introduction. And then we have our wonderful guest, um, Dr. James Kahn and Barbara Cummins, our registered nurse, and we will introduce them after. Barbara will make some comments um, and I will tell you about Barbara after the webinar and also about Dr. James Kahn. So we will start the webinar. Hi, I'm Dr. Ed Weisbart, and I am a proud member of good old fashioned traditional Medicare. Say I'm proud of that because Medicare is a fabulous program. Traditional Medicare has been saving seniors' lives, it's been improving seniors' health, and it's been actually saving our country a fortune by uh, really controlling the cost of health care. Medicare does a great job at rescuing seniors from bankruptcy. We, I don't know where we would be without the traditional Medicare program today. But the reason I want to talk to you is because aside from traditional Medicare, there's a separate program called Medicare Advantage that um, has some issues going on that I think you should know about. And the issues that I'm gonna to describe to you in Medicare Advantage uh, are very similar to issues that are gonna crop up in a new concept called direct contracting entities. But those direct contracting entities are really brand new. We don't have much data about that. So I'll be talking to you about the data from Medicare Advantage uh, about this particular uh, trick that they can do to increase the money that they're paid by Medicare. I think it's important to understand it um, because it has implications for all sorts of reforms. And I believe it's a direct threat to the Medicare program that so many of us know and love. The, the gambit that we're trying to talk about tonight is called upcoding. And it's an arcane term, uh, but the Office of Inspector General uh, just recently declared that upcoding is a major driver of improper payments in the Medicare Advantage program. And that means that they are essentially being able to drain funds from the Medicare trust plan, trust, trust fund, uh, and that has an impact on our premiums and all sorts of things. So we need to understand this. To start, we need to understand what Medicare Advantage is, uh, and it's basically following a long history of privatizing Medicare. So, you know, Medicare, traditional Medicare, is set up so that we pay our taxes, of course, and then uh, that funds the Medicare program. Traditional Medicare directly uh, pays physicians and hospitals and other organizations. So Medicare 
is is pretty direct in how they work this out. Uh, there are some Medicare managed administrators, but it's pretty much run by the Medicare program. Separate and apart from that is what's called Medicare Advantage. So here, instead of Medicare having a relationship with the uh, physicians and hospitals, Medicare doesn't have that for these people. And instead it pays insurance companies, commercial insurance companies, Aetna, Essence, Anthem, and, and others. So instead of paying doctors directly uh, in Medicare Advantage, uh, the federal government pays our money to the insurance companies who then pay uh, doctors and hospitals. Uh, there's a number of issues with that arrangement beyond the scope for tonight, but you need to understand that that's traditional Medicare versus Medicare Advantage. Things that concern me, uh, the one tonight is what you could almost call the Medicare Advantage upcoding money machine. So let's explain this. Primary care physicians submit their claims, their bills for what they did. Uh, and on those bills, they write down diagnostic codes, numbers that explain, that describe the specific diagnosis that a patient has. Uh, and then those codes are sent into the Medicare Advantage plan because uh, that's where they're going to get paid, as we mentioned a moment ago. The Medicare Advantage plan then can use those codes to submit to Medicare a description of how sick or healthy the patients are. So the Medicare Advantage plan tells Medicare, look at all these diagnostic codes that the primary care physicians are submitting. And somewhat appropriately, conceptually, Medicare then pays the Medicare Advantage plan more to take care of patients who have a bunch of high level diagnostic codes. If you're, if Medicare Advantage plan is carrying for, is paying for sicker patients uh, than anybody else, than traditional Medicare, it only makes sense that Medicare would be paying the Medicare Advantage plan more money for the more complicated sicker patients. And indeed that's what this shows. The physician enters a diagnostic code showing that the patient has these illnesses and uh, that goes to the Medicare Advantage plan who then tells Medicare, hey, look, I got all these sick people, pay me more per person because look how sick they are. That fund doesn't come out of thin air. The money to pay the Medicare Advantage plans uh, comes directly from either the Medicare Trust Fund, which has to support this, or from Medicare members uh, through the course of paying their premiums. So that's where the money, of course, comes from. There's no magic money. Uh, and then the Medicare Advantage plan can use that to make some slight, sometimes more significant improvements in what kind of insurance product they offer. A most notable one is that the Medicare Advantage plan uses these extra funds to lower or sometimes eliminate any premium so that some people can actually join Medicare Advantage for free, uh, maybe even not able to keep paying their Medicare Part B uh, premium. So because they're able to figure out a number of tricks, one of which we'll talk to tonight, uh, to get more money out of Medicare, they're able to offer more robust benefits sometimes and, and, uh, and, and reduce the premium. So getting those up codes, getting the higher uh, coding from physicians is critical to being able to offer uh, lower premiums and expanded benefits. Uh, and then when they do those things, of course, more people are lured in uh, and they join the Medicare Advantage plan, the plan grows. What happens when the plan grows? Well, these are often private, uh, commercially owned, uh, for-profit companies, uh, which then are able to offer higher dividends, more stock buybacks, and more profits, the bottom line, for the practice owners. Profits that, as we showed earlier, are coming out of uh, the Medicare Trust Fund or seniors paying premiums. Um, those dollars then, of course, are used to stimulate more primary care coding. If they can come up with tools to get more primary care doctors to submit more complicated codes, that's the game. That's the money machine. They fund these, these tools. And I'm going to show you how this coding has become a very effective business imperative uh, for Wall Street. We will get there. So this particular tool we're going to talk about is coding, which essentially drives what's called a risk score, which, as I said, is appropriately gets Medicare to pay the Medicare Advantage plans more if they can increase the risk code. So what is this risk code? Uh, the acronym is HCC, a hierarchical condition category, or you could just think of it as the, the risk code, really. So here's an example of a very healthy 76-year-old uh, who has nothing else wrong uh, with her. Uh, and so her risk code adds up to a total of 0 0.45. And because of that, uh, in 2019, when this particular report was published, Medicare would be paying the Medicare Advantage plan $4,000 per year. 
there aren't that many 76 year olds that are in such incredibly good health so here's one that has some pretty common illnesses again 76 years old 76 years old baseline payment is again 0 0.45 risk fault risk code but she has these other diagnoses diabetes congestive heart failure and a few other things and because of those extra diagnoses the, which are real in this case so let's say so medicare would then pay the medicare advantage plan substantially more per year for taking care of this person since the medicare advantage plan has to pay their bills that's kind of the deal sicker patient medicare advantage gets more money conceptually that's the way it probably should work but you know once you set up those kinds of rules it's whack-a-mole here's a new game uh, let's figure out how to make those codes the best codes. You know, there's rules for which codes get which payment. There's exact rules about this. And so the game is to come up with the right diagnostic codes, not sort of just the typical diagnostic codes. So, for example, uh, obesity doesn't get you anything if you're a Medicare Advantage plan, but morbid obesity, well, now we're talking. Um, depression, nothing, but major depression, a single episode mild, who would know that's worse? Uh, that gives you more, more payment. And all of these things, these subtle differences in codes, which might even be synonymous, but these subtle differences in codes add up to a substantially higher risk score. And here's the bottom line. Medicare pays the Medicare Advantage plan for this optimized coding, $32,000 a year, more than three times as much if the primary care physician is more casually paying attention to the coding system. So there's a big game to get to the $32,000 from the $9,000. And that's what we're talking about tonight. How do you do that? Um, well, these companies are pretty serious about it. And as a consequence of wanting to get higher coding, which gets higher risk scores, there's a whole, whole industry creating a suite of tools to optimize these results. There's an incessant search for more diagnostic codes. And that's why Medicare Advantage plans are often champions of home care visits, of annual wellness exams. These, these home care visits are not typically a physician coming in to treat you in your house for a real medical illness. No, no, no. These are some sort of a clinician, sometimes a very skilled and you know wonderful clinician, but a clinician coming into your house in search of diagnostic codes. They want to find something more that the Medicare Advantage plan can use to justify billing or telling Medicare that, hey, our patients are sicker and therefore getting the higher um, capitation rates. So there's an incessant search for more codes, and that's why they emphasize some of these kinds of things. They also have the ability, the Medicare Advantage plans have the ability to search through your medical record to find more diagnoses. You would think, oh, wait, HIPAA, there's this law that says that you don't have access to my medical records. And, oh, you do. Uh, there's exceptions to HIPAA, TPO exceptions, treatment, payment, and operations. So if you're involved in me delivering uh, Medicare benefit, and you have either you, know, you can get an exception to HIPAA for either treatment, payment, or operations. And so, because of those exceptions, which makes sense, uh, yes, uh, yes, the Medicare Advantage plans can data mine your electronic health records, and they can use that to come up with more diagnostic codes in a whole suite of other things. Most of the exciting developments that I'm aware of in artificial intelligence and machine learning software, those are happening specifically funded by the interest in searching for more diagnostic codes and other gimmicks uh, to, uh, to get more money out of, um, out of Medicare Advantage. Uh, the second suite of, of strategies here is to, frankly, incent poor blokes like me, primary care doctors and other physicians, to submit more and better codes. So there's incentives for reaching the business metrics. There are sometimes just direct financial incentives, and we'll unpack that a little bit. And then finally, of course, they price their product strategically to, to get the best results. So if they make their price too low, Medicare Advantage plans, if they don't charge enough of a premium, then of course they lose out on, on revenue. They're leaving money on the table. If they price their plans too expensively, well, then they're not going to uh, get, the, get the membership. So they have very sophisticated tools to come up with the exact right price for their market to get the maximum of profitability, growth, uh, and the uh, modicum of expanding Medicare benefits. So there are large new segments of industry, home health care visits, as I was talking about, analytic startups. Uh, there are modules within the electronic health record to drive the capture of these codes. Uh, we mentioned some of these other things. Uh, there are Medicare Advantage-focused uh, primary care startups 
uh, and then strategic building. All of these things that I'm talking about are designed to improve outcomes, and we all like better outcomes. But notice, <laughs> notice that these are tools designed to improve the financial outcomes for the Medicare Advantage plan, not so much to improve anything clinically, maybe some, but not very much. And they have become terrific at this. It's become a core competency. So because these risk scores are worth so much money, Medicare Advantage plans have figured out how to do this. So if you look back over this 10 year, nine year, eight year period, you'll see that the average Medicare Advantage risk score has gone up pretty dramatically and consistently. So they've gotten good at this. Medicare Advantage plans have gotten skilled at, make, at, at scoring their patients higher than traditional Medicare patients. That's what this chart shows. And I can hear the skeptic in the crowd saying, well, Dr. Weisbart, that's because the Medicare Advantage plan has sicker patients. They've been attracting the sicker and sicker patients. And that's why the risk score has been climbing. Au contraire, that has been looked at very carefully. They've been trying to figure out, are Medicare Advantage plan patients getting sicker? Is that why the risk score is going up? Well, that's been looked at. It's been looked at with pharmacy claims data. That's been looked at with mortality rates and hospitalization data and all kinds of deep dives to answer the question, are Medicare Advantage plan patients getting sicker? Is that why the risk score is going up? Is that why Medicare is being, is being compelled to pay more per person to the Medicare Advantage plans? No, that's not what's going on. It's entirely that the Medicare Advantage plans have figured out how to capture more and more aggressive uh, risk scores to drive up the reimbursements. So how do they do this with primary care physicians? What's the, what's the strategy? What, what are the tactics here? And, uh, and they have three main ways that they get us to do more coding. The first is that the Medicare Advantage plan sometimes will actually pay primary care physicians more if we code more. Uh, then there's this concept of value-based care where the contract with us essentially shares a percentage of the Medicare Advantage plan's risk-adjusted premium back with the Medicare Advantage plan's primary care physicians. And we'll explain this more in a moment. Uh, and then finally, the Medicare Advantage plan is, plans are starting to actually purchase primary care physician practices so that they can completely internalize the profits of gaming the, the risk scores. So first, incent us to code more. How does that work? Well, for example, Clover Health, which is a Medicare Advantage uh, PPO plan in various states established since 2013, uh, proclaims on their website, which is on the bottom of the slide, that we provide Clover Assisted. We provide doctors with our Clover Assisted technology at no cost to the primary care doctor. The Clover Assistant will help your primary care doctor get a more complete view of your overall health. Well, you know, of course they're saying that in public because that's a lovely thing. Who would say that's bad? It's a lovely, sounds lovely. And here it is from, again, uh, from them. Here's how it works. They take all of this data uh, and it pumps into the Clover Assistant as a synthetic solution. And then there's all of these solutions on the right-hand side. I am unaware, frankly, of any physician in practice who says that this has added value to their clinical practice. And, that, and I'm unaware of any evidence, compelling, accurate, objective, validated evidence that this is actually improving anybody's quality of care. However, if a doctor puts this on their desktop, their electronic record, and they use this, here's one of the things that they tell doctors, just use it. You don't, we don't care if it changes, just have it there and use it. We don't care, I'm not compelling you to change any codes, just use the Clover Assistant. And we, as a PPO, as a, as a Medicare Advantage PPO, will pay you $30 more per visit on a weekly basis just for using it. No risk, just guaranteed income uh, bump. And because they know, they know that uh, having this on our desktop and getting us to use it guarantees them that they're going to be able to bump up their uh, their risk score and get, uh, as I showed you, pretty phenomenally increased uh, uh, capitation rates from Medicare. So, a pretty substantial incentive. We don't, as a doctor, you know, you would be very tempted to to use that. So that's one of the ways. A second way that uh, that um, we're being encouraged to find the diagnostic codes is to do things that you know you got to really wonder how this happens. So one example would be uh, there are programs in place to encourage us doctors to order carotid artery ultrasounds. To use one example, uh, on Medicare Advantage patients who have no symptoms, the idea being that if we can find somebody uh, who's got 
uh, a blockage in their carotid artery, well, you know, who doesn't want to know that? You know, don't you want to know if you have that? Um, you know, so there are, you've seen ads like this probably, this particular one, um, this one example, but these are all over the place. Well, free vascular health screenings, you know, and, you know, as a patient who hasn't maybe perhaps researched the question, uh, it seems, well, it's great, you know, thank you, Medicare Advantage plan, a free free outreach for a vascular health screening. Everybody wins, right? The patient sees, well, I get this free test, doesn't cost me a penny. If they find I've got a blockage in my neck artery, well then, you know, hooray, let's get that fixed. You know, I didn't get a stroke. Sounds like a great thing. Patient gets stroke prevention and it's not just the patient who benefits. <laughs> the vascular surgeons in the hospital can bill for more services since that's how we pay people. Uh, and just by coincidence, the Medicare Advantage plan can get higher codes to submit to Medicare. So this is great, right? The market is fully aligned. The patient gets better care and the surgeons and hospitals can bill more and the Medicare Advantage plan gets more money. Seems like a great thing, right? Except for one small problem. You're not supposed to do that test. <laughs> Small problem. Um, the United States Preventive Services Task Force, which is a group you should uh, know about um, if you need to try to find some relatively independent, non-biased source of is this a good test to do or a bad test to do? USPSTF, United States Preventive Services Task Force. Uh, and they've looked at the question about carotid artery ultrasounds. Is this a good thing or bad thing to do in an asymptomatic person? Turns out they have recommended twice now, both in 2014, then and again this year, 2021, don't do this test. <laughs> we have the answer. And the reason that they recommend against doing it is because if somebody has symptoms of a small stroke, a warning sign, it's called a TIA or a RIND or whatever, or they had a stroke, if they, if they actually have symptoms then we know that they are at high risk of having another potentially larger stroke. And so that's the person in whom we should do a carotid artery ultrasound to find a blockage that we can fix to prevent the stroke. The problem is um, when you do these, these screenings tests on people who don't have any such symptoms, um, most of them don't have strokes. Most of them really ultimately would not have had a stroke. However, if you find the blockage, you know, we're all kind of freaked out by finding this blockage. And so the reason you did the study in the first place was thinking if you find a blockage, you're going to get an endarterectomy or some procedure to clear out that blockage and prevent a stroke, right? That's a great idea. It's completely wrong because it turns out that the intervention, that procedure to clear out or bypass or do something to your carotid artery, there is some risk to that procedure. There is risk to just doing that thing. And it turns out that the risk in 2014, and even today, still, well, maybe the technology will improve and this will change, but even as of today, the risk of doing a carotid endarterectomy or any surgery to fix the blockage in your neck, the risk of that procedure is worse, is worse than the risk, than the, likely, than the unlikely chance that you would have a stroke from an undetected blockage. So for that reason, because the risk of the intervention is worse than the benefits of it, the United States Preventative Services Task Force is consistently said, hey, if the person doesn't have any symptoms, do not get a carotid artery ultrasound. But, you know, if you find any evidence of the plaque in the artery, you know, the MA, you know, the physician's going to submit that diagnostic code and the diagnostic code gets uh, sent in uh, to, for, for, for Medicare to pay the Medicare Advantage plan nearly $3,000 more on that person. So the Medicare Advantage plan stands to make $2,800 per year for the person who has really has carotid artery obstruction, even though it was dangerous, potentially deadly for the Medicare Advantage plan for anybody to have looked and found it. That's called a perverse incentive. That's called a perverse um, incentive. And they don't just get that $2,800 once, as long as that person's in Medicare, is in that Medicare Advantage plan, that code stays with them and it's $2,800 for the long haul. So it's potentially a lot of money for a relatively inexpensive test, except by the way, it might kill you. So that's one example, one example. So screening increased the plan's wealth, the Medicare Advantage plan's wealth, and it increased the patient's risk of a stroke. Not a good idea. Um, the second type of incentive is to share risk score payments. So uh, this is a direct quote, overall physicians in the, in the value-based program with Humana can get two and a half times more than the fee schedule, value-based. That means that these are people who are getting encouraged to find these codes 
And on average, sometimes they get four and a half times the fee schedule. So if they're in this program, if they're not in this program, their fee for their equivalent might be $44 per member per month. That's how they think about these numbers is per member per month, right? Because that's how the cap capitation works. But if they get into this program, they make they may make four and a half times as much for being involved in these in these programs that share the risk score payments back with the primary care physicians. Or lastly, they might actually, actually in many cases, now they're starting to purchase the physician practices to really internalize all the value. And one of the more recent examples of that, uh, Humana introduced its own brand name group for the primary care physicians that it owns. Um, and it's, the, it, it's now active in Orlando. Um, so, so this is a big deal. This is a big deal. Uh, the Center for, the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget um, said that this is uh, worth over the upcoming over this upcoming uh, seven year period worth two to three and a half billion dollars. Uh, so this could, is worth two and a half to three billion dollars. As I told you earlier, the Office of Inspector General said this is a major issue for uh, for funding in Medicare. These kinds of numbers, these kinds of numbers, in addition to draining the Medicare trust fund and essentially leading us towards really a less stable finance for, for the entire Medicare program. These kinds of numbers are the kinds of numbers that get attention on Wall Street. So that's a big deal because we have, on the advocacy side, we've been focused on the Medicare Advantage piece, right? We've been focused on everything I just said, all of the numbers I've just given you come from our experience with Medicare Advantage and in the healthcare reform advocacy movement, we've been sort of watching with with some trepidation how Medicare Advantage is using all the gains we've showed you to be able to lower premiums and do other things to attract membership. And hence, here's been what almost looks like a relentless march of growth um, of Medicare Advantage members. And to be honest, well, many of us have not paid enough attention to, to what is from Wall Street's perspective, a bigger potential financial opportunity. Yeah, Medicare Advantage has been growing and using all the tricks that I have showed you, but Medicare traditional, good old fashioned Medicare, the kind I have, the kind that 60% of seniors have, that's potentially some untapped market because a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about and things, other similar things that we have not covered tonight, those are things that are off limits in traditional Medicare. Traditional, these things don't happen. Some, a lot of the things that happen to drain the trust fund to Medicare Advantage, commercial insurance companies, those don't happen in traditional Medicare. And so the for-profit private venture, private equity venture capital world has been looking at this 60% of untouched Medicare members and thinking, hmm, I want to get my hands on that. And that's where this new concept, uh, has been, this new uh, pilot project has been coming up called direct contracting entities. Direct contracting entities is essentially a way to, to introduce the uh, for-profit um, uh, corporate world, uh, not just into Medicare Advantage, but into into traditional uh, Medicare. So we showed you this, right? We showed you traditional Medicare with very few, if any, real intermediaries, perhaps some administrators, but no real intermediaries versus Medicare Advantage. So direct contracting entities introduce new risk-bearing intermediaries into Medicare. Um, they're, they're today in the pilot phase. Uh, they are not taking over all of Medicare tonight, um, but this is a pilot project that's sort of in the in the early stages, and if we want to protect Medicare from this from all the same shenanigans that I was talking about and more, um, now is the time that we need to focus on this. Most of these new things, these direct contracting entities, which I'm not going to go through in, in detail tonight, though most of them are investor owned. So some are owned by physician groups and by and by um, specialty providers and ACOs. Uh, again, an acronym acronyms beyond tonight's scope. But most of them are owned by investors. Most direct contracting entities are either publicly traded or publicly backed by private equity and venture capital. And six of them are owned actually by commercial insurance industry companies. Six. There are 53 of them uh, today uh, in 2021. There are 53 of these direct contracting entities. And six of the 53 are owned by insurance companies who have all the skills we were just talking about from Medicare Advantage, they have those skills. Those six are not just six out of 53, they actually represent the majority of people that are being uh, enrolled into direct contract entities. So those six are only six out of 53, but it's, uh, they are the largest uh, group um, of companies here, of, of organizations here. 
So direct contract entities to spend a little bit of time on it as a project uh, that was begun under the Trump administration uh, as a pilot project uh, within the centers for the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. The Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation uh, is something that was created uh, de novo uh, as a part of the Affordable Care Act because at the time the ACA was enacted, there was quite a probably valid sense that there was anti-reform inertia within within the Medicare program. And so they create the ACA created uh, under Section 3021 with uh, a small fortune of money. They created this new department called the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. They've done a lot of things uh, since they've done dozens of pilot projects, some better, some worse. Um, and so some of it, you know, it's, it's a good conceptual kind of uh, thing here. Uh, a, a CMMI pilot can be a, start as a pilot within the Medicare Innovation Center, and then if if the health if Health and Human Services and Health and Human Services Actuary, in fact, uh, declare that it's a, that it's a success, they can roll it out across the entire book of Medicare business, across the entire book of Medicare business. So they have to meet some criteria under the law. They have to show that their pilot program reduces spending without decreasing quality or improves quality without increasing spending and doesn't deny or limit coverage or provision of benefits. So uh, that was what they were, if they can meet those criteria, if they decide that they have met those criteria, then these innovations can be rolled out across the entire book of Medicare business uh, without having to go back to Congress uh, for any further approval. So it's entirely in-house for Medicare to make that uh, decision. So these new DCEs are gonna be under pressure are under pressure to do the same coding trick, right? So the DCEs, the direct the direct contracting entities, engage primary care physicians. That's the way they grow. Um, and then Medicare contracts the DCE for that primary care physician's patients. And then the direct con contracting entity can maximize their capitation from Medicare by driving up coding in exactly the way, same way we were talking about. So as it turns out under the under the, the rules and the rules, uh, the reward for upcoding and direct contracting entities is not as incredibly dramatic as I spelled out here for Medicare Advantage today, but it is still very substantial. The exact percentage is something that is not completely understood yet, but it's it's going to be a pretty substantial piece. So this this gambit that I was showing you tonight uh, applies to not just Medicare Advantage, but it's the same mechanism that's going to be. Um, be applied under the direct contracting model unless we stop the direct contracting model. So this co direct contracting model really represents a potential uh, privatization of the rest of Medicare. There's 60% of us in Medicare who have traditional, good old-fashioned Medicare, original Medicare, and then 40% of us have, 41% uh, I think now, are in Medicare Advantage. So that 60% is not privatized, not commercial, it's entirely publicly run and runs beautifully and effectively Direct contracting as a way for the insurance for the for-profit industries to to fully privatize bit by bit, not tonight, but over the next few years, fully privatize our public good, which is a complete violation of the spirit of a public health program and, and, and changes the focus from better national health into larger corporate profits, corroding the value of a public health plan, increasing the opportunities for profiteering and giving us a complicated message when we're trying to figure out the future of Medicare for all, if it turns into this big for-profit commercial business interest, well, you know, it's gonna be harder to figure out how exactly to advocate for it. So thanks, and let me stop recording. I can figure out how. <laughs> We're back. So that's a um, pretty powerful presentation. Um, and uh, we have two guests with us who are going to give us a little more information and also some commentary on the information that was given to us in um, Dr. Ed Weisbart's webinar. We're also going to drop into the chat uh, PNHP has a petition going to um, members of Congress saying that we do not want these direct contracting entities to be um, adopted. So our first guest 
uh, is Barbara Commons. And Barbara is a retired registered nurse who joined the Peace Corps to work in rural India after working in med surge uh, right out of nursing school in New York. Uh, she came to the single payer movement when she was working at San Francisco State University in the uh, student health service because it was shocking to her to discover that asthmatic college students were unable to care for their asthma and comply with their medical prescriptions because they couldn't afford their inhalers. So lack of affordability meant unnecessary suffering and could mean the difference between life and death for these students. They can't breathe without an inhaler, especially severe asthmatics cannot breathe. So that inspired Barbara to become active with single payer now advocacy for California reform with the legendary uh, Don Beckler. Um, Barbara is a free, frequent participant in the One Payer State's online discussions, providing incisive commentary and often documenting her input with citations and links to data and research. Barbara volunteers as a HICAP counselor. HICAP is a health insurance counseling advocacy program. It is also known as SHIP. This is a program of volunteers who help people with Medicare decisions by assisting family and caregivers to understand health insurance benefits, options, and rights. HICAP offers free unbiased one-on-one -on -one assistance from health insurance counselors like Ms. Commons, who are registered by the California Department of Aging. And Barbara has come full circle in remarking, though she began with college students, she is now finding many seniors who cannot afford their inhalers. They cannot breathe. So Barbara tells us that our greatest asset is original Medicare, tried and true over 56 years. And now is the time we improve it and give it to everyone, one people, one plan, but we can't do that if we allow the creep of these innovative programs like the direct contracting entities. So Barbara, welcome and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Maureen. <clears throat> it, it's a pleasure to be here. I, I'm, I'm so, um, so appreciative that Healthcare LA is, is here. It's probably the most activist uh, chapter and I, I know in uh, California. And it's a real honor to be on one of your panels. <clears throat> also, uh, to be here with Jim Kahn and what we've uh, heard from uh, Ed Weisbart, also an honor. So thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, I have <clears throat> sort of a homespun presentation to show everybody here what traditional Medicare is. So just give me a minute to get back to my... Um, <clears throat> scheme here. Um, maybe you can help me. How do I get back to my original screen? Is it escape maybe? There we go. Okay. And then now I have to find my little documents here. All right, here we go. And then I think I should be there. Good. All right. <clears throat> so we're gonna talk about original or traditional Medicare, same thing. <clears throat> Excuse me. This has been around since 1965. So it's 56 years old and it is the best thing going. In fact, this is the backbone for, for our two bills <clears throat> in uh, the national bill, HR 1976 and AB 1400 here in California. We're using the traditional Medicare as the model for what we want to do uh, to have a national or state-based healthcare system. It's been around for 56 years, tried and true, fiscally sound. People are happy with it. They don't give it up. And we want to take good care of it. <clears throat> and this is really the first time, excuse me, anything has really threatened it. But this is a really significant threat because it's going to change the whole character of what people like about original Medicare. Excuse me a minute. So 
So I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. And you're going to get what I call the <clears throat> new to Medicare presentation that I give to my high cap people. All right. So we're going to start out here. First of all, when somebody wants to get on Medicare, <clears throat> they start out with the Social Security office and they sign up for Medicare Part A and B. All right takes about a month or two before they get their card. Um, but, and then they come usually come and see me, sometimes before that time uh, or sometimes after. And so we sit down and we go over what they have for healthcare then, if they're in an HMO or they've got an employer group health plan, whatever. And I find out a little bit about what they like about their healthcare and things that Maybe they don't like. <clears throat> then we take a look at this sheet here. Medicare choices at a glance. All right, now can everybody see this good on the call? No. No? No, Barbara, we're not seeing your, your screen. Oh, okay. I, I think we're I forgot to share the screen. The screen share. Share. <clears throat> Hold on. All right, how do I get back to the full screen so I can share? You have to click share screen down at the bottom. Okay, I, I'm just, I just have the small screen up at, um, over to the right. Oh, here we go. All right, so share screen. Here we go. All right, then, I'm going to go back to where I was before, right? How about that? I don't see anything yet. Nothing? We don't see your screen. Nothing, huh? The co-host has asked you to start your video. All right. How about now? Uh, we have you now. All right. Uh, should I hit sh share screen again? Yes, see what happens. All right. Okay. And then you see uh, where your your information you're sharing with us is. Uh, oh, yes, right here. Now click on that. There we go. How's that? Yep. Yes. Good. Great. Success. Okay. So um, <clears throat> there's two paths to Medicare. Okay. Can you see that? <clears throat> And so eventually these where you're, a person's going to have to decide which path they want to go on. Path one is original Medicare. <clears throat> We're going to go into the details. And path two is the Medicare Advantage plans, which you've heard a lot about already from Ed Weisbart. All right, under path one, you have part A. <clears throat> these are your inpatient services. And then you have part B, your outpatient services, all right? And then down a little further, you have part D, and part D is your prescription drug coverage, okay? All right, and then just below that, there's something called a Medigap. <clears throat> this is not required, this is optional. But the first three parts, A, B, and D, are all required under Medicare, all right? And you need to sign up for them and get yourself set during your initial enrollment period. And if you don't, there's a penalty down the road. You, you get about a um, seven month period initially, okay? So <clears throat> that's sort of the basic skeleton of traditional Medicare, A, B, D, and then maybe <clears throat> if you want a Medigap policy. And what this does, it goes up here and it covers expenses under A and B, all right? Okay, so <clears throat> under original Medicare, the advantage is you can go to any doctor in any facility that accepts Medicare. And anywhere from 90 to 99% of doctors take Medicare, depending on where you live. 
most, and I would say most hospitals and clinics and everything. Mm, so you have a wide range of choice. Your Medicare is portable. You can take it to any other part of the United States and be covered. Okay, so it's portable, a wide range of choice. The downside is, and it's not a big deal, but there's a little more housekeeping with original Medicare because you have to keep up on your Part D plan every year. We're almost ready to go into the annual enrollment period when you have to renew your uh, prescription drug plan. And you every year the plans change and the, um, um, and, and the prices can change too, okay? So there's a little more housekeeping. You can also in California, change your Medigap carrier, the company that sells your Medigap. If you find another carrier that will charge less money, you get to change 30 days after your birthday. It's called the birthday rule. <clears throat> All right, now let's take a look at the next page. Hold on a second here. Here we go. Okay. So here's, here's um, Medicare Part A, all right? Okay, inpatient, all right? If you've worked 10 years or 40 quarters, you get it free, no premium. Some people have to pay something because they haven't got that. All right, here we go. Here's the services under Medicare Part A. Can people see this clearly? Pretty good? Yes, we can. Good. So you go run to the hospital. Medicare pays everything after a deductible of $1,484. You would pay that or maybe a Medigap. Or if you happen to have qualified for Medi-Cal, Medi-Cal will pick this up. All right. Medi-Cal is like a supplement. Okay. If you need skilled nursing, Medicare will pay the first 20 days. And after that, <clears throat> there's a $185 charge per day. You would pay that or a Medigap or Medi-Cal. All right. Home health care. <clears throat> if you go home from the hospital and the doctor wants you to have a nurse come in or you need equipment, Medicare is very generous. They pick up everything except 20% of equipment charge. And again, Medicare would pay that. Hospice, again, Medicare is very generous. They pick everything up except for $5 on prescriptions or 5% of respite care. All right, so that's the outpatient. Now we'll take a look at the, excuse me, that was the inpatient. Now we're in the outpatient care. Same thing. <clears throat> okay, first of all, it has a deductible. So the first $203 of expenses you would pay or Medigap or Medi-Cal. Okay, there's a monthly premium. Uh, it's $148.50 this year. People with high income pay a little bit more depending on their income. Okay. People with lower incomes may not pay this and may be subsidized. All right, so now we have the services, doctor visits, ambulance, outpatient hospital care, if you need a procedure done in the doctor's office, medical equipment, prevention. Medicare is very good at prevention. All kinds of screenings are free, okay? Anything the doctor feels because of your health history you need to be screened for, Medicare will pay for it. Now, if it turns out you have a problem, then you'll go into Medicare pay, will pay 80% and you would pay 20% or a Medigap or Medi-Cal would pay it, okay? So prevention and also mental health services and clinical labs are free under original Medicare, all right? So we're just ta still talking about original Medicare. Okay, now here we go with the Medigaps. 
this is where it gets a little bit overwhelming sometimes for people because now we're, we're going from talking about part A and part B to plans A all the way across to N, okay? And so people have to sit down later on and study this and they have to decide what benefits they want covered and then they look across for the plans and pick the plan they want. And then we can run a little rate comparison. Um, if you go to any carrier and you want say plan A, it's gonna be the same no matter who's the carrier, but they can all charge something differently. So this, this part of it takes a little bit of work. All right. And then how it works is you go to the doctor and you bring two cards, if you have a Medigap. You bring your Medicare card and you bring your Medigap carrier card. And then the person in the doctor's office will bill both, all right? So we went over some of the things that it could cover. Uh, the 20% of Medicare Part B services, the hospital deductible, hospice uh, skilled nursing, um, it can play, pay the Medicare Part B deductible, um, excess charges. Okay, this is a small point. I don't think I'll mention it. But some doctors take Medicare and agree to only charge the Medicare approved amount and other doctors don't. Uh, they can charge 15% over. And some, some of these plans have foreign travel emergency care. Okay, now, the tricky thing about these in California is you can buy one of these when you're first on Medicare or some other, a few other special events, and they can't ask you about your health history. It's called a guarantee issue. Okay. After you've been on Medicare for a while and you try to buy one of these and go back, go back to traditional Medicare or buy one of these, they can deny you if you have a health history with problems, okay? So that's not too cool. Um, California, I, I hope California comes around. We have four states back in New England who have a much more lenient system where you can basically change your Medigap carrier or come into a Medigap, I think it's once a year, okay? Which is really nice because it really gives people the choice to move back and forth between the two paths. Barbara, we have yeah. about two more minutes. About two more two minutes. minutes. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. So that's traditional Medicare. Now you've heard about the Medicare Advantage plans. Okay. These plans are fee for service. That means you go to the doctor, the doctor decides what he did for you. He bills Medicare. Medicare reimburses him according to a price book. Everything's got a price book. And it's Medicare with the price book, not an insurance company, which is really good. Okay? All right. So that's traditional Medicare. I'm going to skip over the other one. Uh, you know, that's by capitation, the Advantage plans. And I want to just make a couple comments. The DCEs. What happens if the DCEs happen? Well, you're going to have your doctor spending more time following the rules, doing what he needs to bring in the money than he was when he had with his care for you. There's going to be less time for patient doctor communication. All right. What else? There's going to be more emphasis on profit instead of care. Okay. And, uh, uh, more wasted money on administration. It, it's just amazing. And I'm, I'm seeing from what I'm reading the same kind of things, um, things to, to entice people into these uh, plans. Now, I'm going to drop in the chat a couple things, and maybe we can send the chat out to people. Um, hold on a second here. Uh, I'm going to send out the uh, list of uh, places. If, if people here are mostly California, I'll tell you the places, doctors and clinics in Riverside, San Diego, and Los Angeles are on the list for 
2022. Okay, so I'm going to drop in the chat a list of participants, clinics, doctors, etc. And I'm going to drop in there a list of cities across the country. So take a look at this. Um, as I said, um, it's all over the country, about 15 cities coming in next year, if we don't stop it. All right. Anyhow, um, I really appreciate your attention to this. Be glad to take your questions. And I want you to know my vision for this is I want a national health system with no financial barriers to care. I want it disconnected from our jobs. And I want it to be one people, one plan. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank, thank you, Barbara, so much. I really appreciate it. You're it's welcome. important to understand what the traditional Medicare program is to compare it to the Medicare Advantage and then realize what the direct contracting entities, how that would even exaggerate what we have with the Medicare Advantage. Can you um, stop sharing your screen now? Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. Aha, there it is. Thank you, Barbara. Sure. Um, we'll have questions after. So, so write your questions down, keep your questions. I'm going to introduce Dr. James Kahn. Um, and he will talk to us a little bit with his um, ideas and impressions about what's going on with um, Medicare, Medicare Advantage, and the direct contracting entities. So Dr. Jim Kahn is a professor emeritus at the Philip Maureen, Arley. Maureen, let me, yep. let's not spend any time on... Uh, Silly okay. introductions. Okay. Uh, it's just, it's let's, been, um, let's think about the timing. I know we're we're offered. at the end of the planned time. Um, if I speak for uh, three to five minutes, and then, will that be okay in order to give people a chance? Uh, to... No, we uh, our end time is is eight fifty. Is it? Oh, great. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I said that to you. Our end time is eight. Our end time is eight fifty. I had it wrong in my calendar. Okay, well, fabulous. Yeah. That's that's so good. So have, I will, I will not have to, to rush you. I actually only have a few points. I'm very pleased to be able to follow on uh, Ed and Barbara, who have covered, uh, very well covered the basic information. But I want to highlight a few points and add a couple of points. My first um, point that I want to highlight is the consequences of the upcoding that uh, Ed was talking about. Indeed, there is a whole business model built around the upcoding. And when various people, including MedPAC, which is the sort of technical advisory body for uh, Medicare, looked at the net result of all that upcoding on the amount of money that Medicare Advantage is getting, they there were several evaluations and the estimates range from 2% to 16% overpayment. Overpayment meaning the Medicare Advantage is managing to use the coding system to make their patients look sicker, even though their patients are, are generally healthier and to overpay, that's money that comes out of the Medicare trust fund and that is denied to traditional Medicare. So it's clearly not an inefficient strategy for the Medicare program. Um, another uh, tactic that uh, I don't think Ed mentioned today, which is always important to remember, is that aside from upcoding, Medicare Advantage programs work very hard to attract healthy patients and to get rid of sicker patients. Attracting healthy patients uh, is fondly referred to as cherry picking. I think we all have heard that one. Uh, it, 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 there's a question, isn't that Medicare fraud? Uh, we'll come back to the questions later. <laughs> um, the other, uh, the, the uh, opposite of cherry picking is lemon dropping, meaning when someone is more expensive, maybe getting costly and complicated end of life care, Medicare Advantage plans will do everything they can 
to discourage people from staying in the Medicare Advantage plan. And there is good evidence from real scientific studies that they are managing to have those expensive patients leave Medicare Advantage and return with all of their high costs to traditional Medicare. So not only are they getting overpaid, but then they're essentially shedding the expensive patients as much as possible. Um, when the Kaiser Family Foundation did a survey recently of the financial barriers to care for people in traditional Medicare with a Medigap policy and overall, and compared that to the financial barriers of people in Medicare Advantage, what they found is that people in Medicare Advantage had were much more likely to experience financial barriers to care, especially if they were poor and if they were sick. So Medicare Advantage does pretty well financially for people who are healthy. As Ed said, they offer some, usually some extra benefits. They take that extra money they receive from CMS and they offer up a really attractive benefit package for someone who's pretty healthy. But once people get sick and may not be able to get optimal care in their narrow provider network, which is what many Medicare Advantage plans offer, uh, then uh, they are um, they they then have to pay out of pocket a lot more to get the kind of care that they want, and they face significant financial barriers. So the the combination of all these factors makes Medicare Advantage a really bad deal, both for the enrollees and for the government. That was point one. Point two, I want to talk a little bit about the DCEs, the direct contracting entities. They are, as Ed and Barbara said, um, potentially a major distraction from providing clinical care because their focus is on uh, these, these DCE companies, some of which are physician-owned and some are private, are working with doctors to take on some of the risk and to make money by, as Ed said, upcoding. So their focus is going to be on upcoding. And we have a long history within Medicare of a similar type of program. They're called ACOs or accountable care organizations. And as it happens, just recently, I published along with Kip Sullivan, who is a, a uh, I'm sure you've heard of him, uh, a big Medicare for all activist from uh, Minnesota, uh, a review of the ACO experience. And what we found is there's no evidence that ACOs save money for Medicare, uh, but there is you know, ample evidence that it is a major distraction for physician organizations, for provider organizations to do that. And DCEs are modeled largely on the ACO model. So in our, in our paper in a, the Journal of General Internal Medicine, one of our good medical journals, we basically said, why are we continuing to pursue these ideas that don't work and are a distraction? So I very much agree we need to be careful about DCEs. And the last point I'll make is we need to be careful about DCEs for something which is not yet possible. But DCEs seem to be setting the stage. And that is Medicare Advantage companies getting into traditional Medicare using the DCE structure which um, gives permission for these companies to recruit doctors and patients. And the, the patient recruitment is, is passive. The patients don't have to actively agree. They, they don't even know what's happening. What's gonna happen next, if we're not careful, is that all of a sudden the, those panels of patients will be drawn into Medicare Advantage, and without any 
official policy decision just because there is a research unit in CMS that is permitted to do these large demonstration projects. So I think I'll stop there. I just wanted to highlight those few points and I'm happy to participate in answering the questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Khan. Yes, we can go, we can go. Uh, we have actually no, we had no end point. We um, decided to let this go as long as we have questions. So um, Paul and um, Erica, questions? Um, Dr. Khan, do you want to take the question from Lynn about isn't that uh, Medicare fraud? Right. I wasn't sure. Lynn, uh, what specific um, part of what I said were you asking about? It? Is it Medicare fraud? I think it was the upcoding. Um, yeah. So it was something you said that. that sounded like it was blatantly fraud. Yeah, so it's a mix of aggressive but legal uh, clinical coding where, you know, the, the, there are diagnoses that are being missed by um, providers in traditional Medicare uh, because there's really very little incentive for them to do it. Um, and so it's legal for Medicare Advantage to look for legitimate diagnoses. Uh, but mixed in with that are, there are definitely cases of fraudulent, um, overly aggressive coding where uh, people are given uh, diagnoses, for example, that may have been listed as provisional or, you know, this, there's a term, there's the terminology in medicine rule out, which means think about, but you don't know if the person has it. And, you know, if that's used to make a, an upcoding uh, diagnostic addition, then that's fraudulent. And there are certainly examples of that. I'm sure we don't know more than a few percent of the fraudulent efforts. I think I just read, um, if I'm correct, that Sutter just got charged with fraud and had to pay a fine. I think it was Medicare fraud. Yeah, I can't keep track. And, and I know, you know, but you can be sure that someone just put in, so did Kaiser, you can be sure that uh, whatever is being found is a small portion of what's actually going on. Thanks. Paul, do you have a question from Facebook? If not, I'll continue with the Zoom hands. Yes, I do. Um, here's one that was put in, okay, by Randy Hicks. How do we get there when both Cal AIM and master plan on aging want to use medical managed care. What is Cal A? I don't know. Cal AIM, A I M. Oh, let's say I, I don't know if that is either. Um, I, I I'll just say quickly that uh, I I am not the. Uh, the strategist for how we get to Medicare for all. I know how I hope that I'm contributing uh, by making sure that the technical information that supports what we're saying is out there and made readily available. And I'll just use this as an opportunity to advertise for Health Justice Monitor. Those of you who are not Health Justice Monitor, um, uh, 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 recipients, uh, sign up. It's free. Just go on the web and look at the website, and then you can sign up for daily emails. And Paul, you wrote stack. What What's the uh, stack reference? I oh, I, that, that's okay. I'm gonna. We're we're alternating back and forth between Facebook and Zoom. Okay. So, um, Jeffrey, you're next. Do you want to go ahead and unmute and ask your question? <laughs> Uh, Jeffrey, your sound is not working. Jeffrey, sorry, we can't. Okay, there you go. Try it again. Uh, 
his questions in the chat. His questions in the chat. Okay, I'm gonna look for that. But Betty, you go ahead with your question, and then I'll go to Paul for a Facebook question. Well, Betty, you know, ahead. I'm a little um, confused as to what exactly a DC is and does. I mean, I understand the Medicare Advantage. Um, companies, you know, they provide administration and useless gym memberships. But what does DCE do? I'm not like, what do they do? Yeah, my un understanding with DCE is they're, again, very similar to accountable care organizations. And there's some overlap between the programs. So they go in and they make a contract with the doctor. Um, they may, in theory, what they're trying to do is save money, save money for CMS, for Medicare, by perhaps encouraging uh, good preventive screenings or uh, other, uh, other particular actions, maybe get coordinating care a bit better. But as part of this, they are making sure all of the diagnoses are reported. In other words, they're upcoding and they set it up so that the physician uh, receives an incentive in some form, either a, uh, a, a regular payment or a payment for a particular activity. And then uh, at the end of the year, they see if that the amount of money spent for the patient population seen by those physicians is more or less than expected when adjusted for this clinical severity. So it's a very complex set of actions, which in theory could lead to some real savings and will definitely lead to more coding for clinical severity. And um, CMS says it'll save CMS money, but the experience actually is it doesn't save money and it may increase costs to CMS by this aggressive coding. I just have a follow-up uh, um, with that, if I may. Um, so it seems like, you know, the proof is there. Uh, I mean, that's exactly what they're doing is upcoding when it's unnecessary, um, the Medi Medicare Advantage uh, uh, plans. Um, so whether they want to believe it or not, um, it's, it's more expensive to do this type of uh, ACO, do this type of capitation, do this type of upcoding. Um, you know, what's the logic in, in, in allowing this to happen? It, it, it's just because it has the potential, but we already see in fact that it's not saving money. Yeah, um, I'll add something to that, uh, Betty. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah, okay. Um, I um, one of the things I dropped in the chat has a, a Q&A on uh, the DCE, and I learned a lot from this. But basically what we're in is they're into the enticement of patients and providers. And the providers is usually a, a financial gain. Uh, and, for the, and for the patient or the client or the beneficiary, it's some kind of extra service much the same way that the Advantage plans entice people in with vision, dental, hearing aids, gym memberships, okay? And uh, they, it's very attractive. I mean, this, there's plans now, they call them special needs plans that offer things like food shopping and house cleaning and all kinds of what they now are calling social service. And so the, this is the kind of thing that right now, it's called enticements for the provider and the beneficiaries. Um, it, it, it's earmarked for, for only for those in tr traditional Medicare um, uh, with Part A and B in a drug plan. Um, they're not taking anybody with Medi-Cal for this. And um, they, um, they're, and it's, it's voluntary. You don't have to join. You don't have to be a part of it. Uh, you won't know you're a part of it until your doctor probably tells you. And they're working on that communication now. So I'm going to drop this in the chat again for people who want to read more about it. 
th this is brand new for everybody. Um, thank you so much. Um, okay, so I've looked through the chat and I only see one thing from Jeffrey and it looks more like a comment than a question. Um, and he wrote, like others, I left medical billing in 2006, did not realize how much upcoding had increased. So Jeffrey, if there is a question you wanna ask, please type that into the chat and we'll go ahead and make sure to read that for you. Um, next is Cheng Sim. Uh, yes, um, this is something that um, Jim Khan touched on a little bit, but I wonder if you guys can dig deeper. Um, so my question is, what justification is the CMS innovation unit using for the DCE pilot program? How are they justifying justifying cost decrease slash quality improvement when upcoding has resulted in increased payments from CMS, uh, according to the chart that at Weisbert showed? How do they justify what what they're doing? Is your basically your question? How are they justifying as a benefit? Uh, because the criteria that Ed uh, Weisbart shared with us was that the, any kind of reform has to either decrease costs and keep quality the same, or improve quality and uh, you know keep costs the same. So, I'm sorry. Uh, this is probably you know I'm limited in in the words I can use. I don't want to be profane, but it's a mystery to me. I'm serious. Um, you know, there, there's, uh, <clears throat> there's lip service given to the idea that what we want to do is improve quality and reduce costs. And then when the opposite happens and the technical consensus is that the opposite has happened, then the lobbyists move in and uh, make sure that the agency and of course people in Congress uh, protect their interests. And so the lobbyists for the Medicare Advantage industry are very effective at getting you know, annual adjustments to the payment rates and make sure that CMS uh, both allows and fosters Medicare Advantage. Um, and the original criteria which you mentioned, which proved to be not un unmet uh, and perhaps uh, going in the wrong direction, don't seem to come into, you know, th this is, in case you were unaware, uh, our health policy endeavor here is a social change undertaking. Uh, it's a power structure issue. The people who are making lots of money have a lot of power. And uh, that is indeed a major challenge for us. Thank you. Um, Maureen Cruz. Yeah, one, one of my concerns, and I'd like your um, opinions on it, both Barbara and Dr. Kahn. Um, do you think that the public's trust in our medical system is suffering with these scams and kind of the blatant dishonesty? Um, as, as you noted, only the tip of the white iceberg is all that we're really seeing coming out with these um, you know, federal complaints against some of these insurance companies, but still people in our everyday um, interactions with the medical system, we are facing this. I, I mean, I've looked at upcoding on myself, on my mother, and it's just like, you know, it's like ridiculous. It doesn't even look like the same, you know, like a description of the person. That right? That's really interesting. So how can we, how can we trust I feel like we're losing, I'm a nurse and I've lost trust in our healthcare system. Um, I'm barely hanging on because I, I see that these, these tests um, are given that are unnecessary and that they come up with things that are, you know, there are no symptoms for. And one of the dangers of that is, is uh, being given medications. For instance, my mother was given medications based on um, diagnostics that I really question the diagnostics. So it's, um, you know, do you think this is going to irreparably harm our trust and belief in our healthcare system? I, I think most, my own opinion is that most people are 
oblivious to the problems. They see what they see and if they are relatively healthy and they're, they like their primary care doc and Medicare Advantage, they probably you know, remain oblivious. I think ultimately, yeah, the trust in the system is you know, very much uh, at risk. Um, and um, the, I think the more visible problems we've had were in COVID when so many millions lost their insurance. And um, at the same time, the insurance companies had record profits. And I think that my guess is that was probably noticed by quite a few people. Um, by the way, for those who don't know, if you do polling on how many people want to move to a single payer system and you give them a fair choice, certainly in California, uh, about two thirds of people uh, or more, if you, depending on who you ask, uh, support single payer. So there's a, a huge amount of popular support. I think, again, I go back to my concern, not my expertise, but my concern, which is how do we deal with the power structure that's preventing proper attention to a, an efficient and equitable health system? Barbara, um, do you have last comments, Barbara and, and Dr. Khan? Any last comments? Um, I, I'll, I'll just say again, we have a 56 year legacy of a wonderful way to take care of people, traditional Medicare. It can be improved. We need to get rid of the financial costs that keep people from going to the emergency room or whatever. We can do that. We have, we, the wealthiest country in the world can do this. Okay, we all have to realize that this we're, we've, they've kept us waiting for 56 years. It was always meant for everybody. So we have to fight for it and we have to demand it. No more acting, no more playing nice and polite. We have to demand it. We, our people need, and we've seen this with COVID, how we've all come together, which is great. We're, we're in a coming together mood for this to happen not in five years or two years or not right now. This has to happen right now. And I think uh, it'll be a, a great service to our country. So Thank hopefully you. We, hopefully we are all coming together for AB 1400 in California. Yes, so, yes. Thank you, Barbara, so much. Um, really appreciate your expertise and your sharing with us. And um, Dr. Jim Kahn, do you have any final comments to make? I do not. I, I just uh, echo Barbara's sentiments. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much for being here. We have put in the chat, there's a petition from PNHP um, to oppose these direct contracting entities. So um, please um, grab that petition out of the chat. And also there's a YouTube of the PNHP webinar that was done on the direct contracting entities last Thursday. And there is a, a link to that YouTube also in the chat. So yeah. thank you so much, both of you for spending your time with us this evening. We really appreciate it. Um, we know we all need to work together in solidarity. We have an opportunity here in California. We have AB 1400 that could really stop things like this DCE in its tracks. And once achieved, we would not have to worry about dealing with um, piecemeal stripping away of our care. Because once the governor, the people in the assembly, you, myself, homeless people, um, people struggling, once we are all in the exact same plan and nobody gets to buy their way out of it, three things will happen. We will have everything we need. It will be high quality and it will be paid for and funded. Believe me, if the governor and you and I had the same plan, those three things would happen. So that's what we want to do with AB 1400. Thank you so much everybody for being on the call. Have a good evening and um, best wishes. Um, do get onto our website, please. Um, Healthcare for All Los Angeles. We have CalCare toolkits, ways that you can help make sure that AB 1400, when it comes to the, the assembly in 
January that it can pass those committees. We need this bill and we need it a long time ago. So thank you so much, everybody. Take care. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank Good you. night. Thank you. Good night. Any way to uh, copy the chat? I, I could send you the, um, yeah, you can, hold on, let me just wait a minute. You can send it to me. I probably won't be able to pull it off, so. Um, well, let's see. It's called Save Chat. If you look at the chat itself and it says there's a smiley face, a document, and three dots, click on the three documents, I mean the three dots, and it'll say, uh, let's see, save chat on the top. Click on that and you will be able to save your chat. Oh, okay. And where is that? It's a, it's right on the chat uh, thing. Yeah. I just clicked on well, chat. It says everyone and then it's there's a little piece of paper kind of thing. And it's, oh, and yeah. It's right. Okay. Good. The top of the three dots says save chat. Right. Click on that and it'll save it on your desktop. Oh, great. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're Healthcare welcome. for Thank LA. You. HCALA. Go. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> So long. Bye. -bye. Good Bye -bye. night.